So we're going to talk about um, signals that you've got a chemical change going on right, versus a physical change, which we've talked about the difference between those two. Uh, how to write a chemical equation, and there's kind of a couple of different ways to write an equation. There's simple versions and then the complete version. And then we'll go through the process of how to actually balance a chemical equation. So a couple of terms that we have talked about before, but they're very critical to what we're doing now, so worth defining again. A chemical change means you're starting with one or more substances. They could be elements or compounds. And they undergo a change whereby the atoms are rearranged, combined in different ways, and you get new compounds or different elements that are by themselves. We're taking the pieces apart and putting them together in different ways, and you get new stuff. That's a chemical change versus a physical change like boiling water. When you boil water, it's still water. It just goes from a liquid to a gas. But a chemical change is turning water into, say, hydrogen peroxide, which is a totally different thing. And then the law of conservation of mass, which is one of the most fundamental principles in chemistry, says that a chemical reaction involves moving atoms around and combining them in different ways, but the atoms that you start the reaction with are the exact same atoms you end the reaction with. They've just been put together differently. So you can't add anything, you can't lose anything during a chemical reaction. And that's how we get to this concept of balancing the equation, which later on will lead us to the next topic, which we'll get to after break, um, called stoichiometry, which is predicting how much product you're going to get based on a certain starting amount. A couple things that you can look for that are signs that a chemical change or chemical reaction has taken place. And all of these could be confused with physical changes depending on what's going on. Um, the first is a change in temperature. Now again, that's not saying you put water on the stove and it boils because you're heating it. That's adding heat. Change in temperature in this case means you take two things that are at room temperature, for example, mix them together, and all of a sudden it gets very hot or very cold. That's because of a chemical reaction that's either releasing energy or absorbing energy. Uh, that's how hot and cold packs work. You start this chemical reaction that absorbs energy. It makes it feel cold uh, when you put it to your skin. Changes in color, same thing. Not mixing yellow and blue to make green. But if you mix yellow and blue and you get orange, which would be not explained by just mixing the two colors, that's probably because of a chemical reaction. Or you take two things that are clear, mix them together, and the combination turns pink or green or something like that. That would indicate that a chemical reaction is taking place. And then um, if you mix things and they start to bubble, like the classic baking soda and vinegar, they don't start out bubbly, but when you put them together, all of a sudden you get bubbles, you get the volcano science project. That's because one of the products of the reaction is carbon dioxide gas that's been formed by the reaction. Okay, so what we're working with today and throughout this process of balancing equations and then doing the stoichiometry stuff that we're going to do a little later on, all comes back to a chemical equation. Now, chemical equations look a little different from math equations because we use different symbols and we're using um, you know, formulas with element symbols and things like that. But a lot of the same concepts apply in terms of having the same stuff on both sides. Whatever you do to one side, you're going to do to the other and things like that. And for the purposes of this chapter, you can assume that a reaction always goes from left to right. Later on, we'll talk about reactions that go in both directions, but for right now, assume that all reactions go from left to right, which means the stuff on the left, which is called the reactants, is the starting material that you put into the reaction. 
And then they undergo these changes, and you end up with different things on the right called the products. So the stuff that goes into the reaction of the reactants, the stuff that comes out the other side are the products. That's pretty um, easy to tell because they're separated by the arrow in the middle, which we're going to talk about next. Here are the different symbols. Okay, so the plus sign is the marking point between two substances in an equation. So you've got propane plus oxygen. That means propane is one substance, oxygen is another substance, they're going to react. And they produce, on the other side, carbon dioxide plus water. So those are the two products. So whenever you see a plus sign, that's telling you, okay, so Everything before the plus sign was one substance. The next thing is a different substance, and then there might be more than, more than two, and then you have more plus signs. The arrow is similar to the equal sign in a math equation. It separates the stuff you're starting with from the stuff you end up with. It tells you, here's where the reaction happens. Everything to the other side, where the arrow is pointing to the right, is what comes out of the reaction. And then the little letter abbreviations down the bottom are just telling us what form those different substances are in. Are they solid, liquid, gas, or aqueous? Aqueous means dissolved in water. And those should always be included in a finished chemical equation. Some of the examples that we'll go through won't have all that because we're focusing on other parts of the equation. But uh, they should always be there because different things behave differently whether they're solid liquids or gases sometimes. So if you're trying to explain to somebody how you did something, you need to tell them, I did this as a, ga a gas or I did this as a solid so that they can recreate it later. Okay, so here's a reaction. There's a description of a reaction. Solid aluminum reacts with liquid bromine to produce solid aluminum bromide. That tells you what's happening in this reaction. We're going to take this sentence and translate it through a couple of steps into a balanced chemical equation that you would write in a lab report or something like that. And this sentence is going to be how we read every single equation that we do after this. When we get to the end, you would read the end balanced equation exactly the same way you would read this sentence. And I'll show you what I mean in a second. So... The first step in writing a balanced uh, equation, and depending on what you're doing, you won't have to go through all of these steps every single time. I'm not going to give you a sentence and have you go through all these steps, but you could be given any one of these types of equations to start with. You might start with a sentence, and it asks you to write a balanced equation. You might start with this, what's called the word equation, and say write the balanced equation and so on. But you don't have to go through every step every time. It just depends on the question. All we did here was we took some of the words in the sentence and converted them into those symbols that we saw a couple slides ago. So instead of writing the word solid, we put the S. Where it says reacts with, that's where we put the plus sign. To produce is the arrow. And we have the product on the other side, which is the solid aluminum bromide. So just abbreviating some of the things, getting it into more of a mathematical type of statement uh, and then we're gonna keep going down from here to get to a balanced chemical equation at the end. Okay, a skeleton equation which is what's down at the bottom. This is when we're doing balancing chemical equations and things like that most of the time you're gonna be given a skeleton equation and that just means it's got all the formulas, all the symbols for solid liquids or gases, the plus signs, the arrows, the only thing that's missing, which is what we're going to talk about next, is that this equation at the bottom is not balanced. We'll talk about that in a second. But again, I want to point out that the thing at the bottom, that equation at the bottom of the page there, says exactly the same thing as the sentence that we started with. Solid aluminum reacts with liquid bromine to produce solid aluminum bromide. That's how you read the equation at the bottom of the page. 
It's just been abbreviated into element symbols and formulas. Now that tells you what all the elements are. It tells you the formula of aluminum bromide, if you didn't know that. It tells you that bromine comes in those diatomic molecules, they're called. Um, pairs of atoms, things like bromine, oxygen, nitrogen, come in that grouping. But this equation doesn't obey the law of conservation of mass. Because if you look down here, there's two bromines on this side, and there's three bromines on that side. So we've got a different number of atoms. That's not allowed. What's also not allowed is changing those little numbers to make it work. Because the formula for bromine is Br2. The formula for aluminum bromide is AlBr3. I can't do anything about that. But what I can do, which is what we're going to do next, is I can use a different number of bromine molecules and a different number of aluminum bromide molecules to make the numbers match up. Okay, so what I did here at the bottom is I added what are called coefficients. Coefficients are these big numbers in front of these different substances. And what those big numbers tell me is there's two aluminum atoms on the left. There's three sets of bromine molecules on the left. And then there's two groups of aluminum bromide on the right-hand side. And I'll point out, because it can be confusing, and you want to say, oh, you've got to add another aluminum to the left. Keep in mind that coefficients are multiplication, not addition. Okay, so it's three times bromine. It's two times aluminum bromide. So I haven't changed the formulas at all. But now if you count up the numbers... Right? The 2Al means there's two aluminums on that side. The 3 multiplies times the 2 here and gives me a total of 6 bromine atoms. And then this 2 over here multiplies the whole aluminum bromide. So it gives me 2 aluminums and then 2 times 3 or 6 bromines. So I'm multiplying the big numbers times the little numbers to figure out how many atoms there are. Now I've got 2 and 6, and 2 and 6, the equation is now balanced. Same stuff on both sides. And one of the things that sometimes gets confusing is I told you you can't have any, take, add any atoms to one side. You can't take away atoms from another side. Law of conservation of mass. But it looks like I just added a bunch of stuff. I multiplied 3 times this, 2 times that. Where did all that come from? I'm just making stuff up. You have to remember that these reactions are taking place in either a solution or in a beaker or whatever where there's trillions and trillions of these atoms floating around. So I can sort of pick out however many atoms I need. I just have to, I can't change the formulas of them. So it's like having basically an unlimited bucket of Lego bricks. I can't take a 2x4 Lego brick and make it into a 2x2 two two Lego brick, but I can pull out as many 2x4 Legos as I need to make it work, or whatever combination you want to think about. That's what we're talking about with these molecules. There's trillions and trillions of bromine molecules in this reaction. I'm just combining them in a very specific ratio so that the number of bromines is the same on both sides, and that's what I'm doing by adding those coefficients. Okay, so again, it all goes back to the law of conservation of mass. Atoms are not created or destroyed by a chemical reaction, which is why you have to have the total number of the same atoms of each element on both sides. And we do that with these coefficients, these big numbers that we're putting in front of molecules or, or atoms to multiply. All right, so now I'm going to walk through the process of how
to balance the equation using this reaction as an example. Propane gas reacts with oxygen gas to produce carbon dioxide gas and water, and it probably should say water vapor, water mm -hmm. gas. Uh, I would expect you to know that oxygen, for example, is O2, carbon dioxide is CO2, water is H2O, things like that. Um, but propane gas is not a formula you need to memorize, so that would be given to you in a problem like this. So we're going to take this statement, turn it into an equation, and then balance it. So... This first step, again, you might not have to do this and probably won't have to do this a lot of the time because you'll be given this skeleton equation to start with. But if you're given the sentence or you're given the word equation, the first step is to put it into a skeleton equation. Put all the formulas into this format. C3H8 propane reacts with O2 oxygen and produces carbon dioxide CO2 plus H2O water. So if you don't have a skeleton equation, that's where you start. Put it into an equation. It's not at all balanced. Now you've got very different numbers on either side, and we're going to fix that. But this is the starting point for balancing an equation. All right, so here is the first step if you have the skeleton equation or after you've got the skeleton equation written out. You have to tally up all the atoms on both sides of each element. So not the total number of atoms, but how many atoms of each element do you have? And I usually like to just put a line right down the middle where the arrow is so I can very clearly separate the left from the right and keep track. Keeping track of the numbers from this point out is the most important part of this whole process. Because if you lose track of the numbers, you're never going to figure it out, or you'll get an answer that's not correct. So I'm just going to start with the first thing in the list, which is carbon, and the little number called the subscript right here tells me that there are three carbons on the left-hand side of the equation. The hydrogen has an eight next to it. There's eight hydrogens. And on the left-hand side, we've got O2, so that means two oxygens. All those little numbers, the subscripts, only go with the thing right in front of them. So the 8 for hydrogen has nothing to do with the carbon. Um, on the other side, which we'll get to in a minute, the 2 for the oxygen doesn't affect the carbon on that side. So on the right-hand side, we've got one carbon... We've got two hydrogens, just to keep them in the same order. Now the oxygen, and here's the first thing you have to look out for. The oxygen is in two different places on the right-hand side. On the left, it's all together O2. On the right-hand side, you've got CO2 and you've got H2O. So you have to keep track of all those atoms that are floating around. So the total number of oxygens is three on the right-hand side. All right. So none of them are the same, which means we're going to have to change some things to get it to balance out. And I can't, again, I can never touch those little numbers at the bottom, can't change those at all. But what I can do is put the coefficients, the big numbers, in front of anything I need to, and I can use whatever number I need to make all the atoms come out the same on both sides. So I'm going to do that, and I'll just quickly rewrite... 3 carbon, 8 hydrogen, 2 oxygen, and 1 carbon, 2 hydrogen, and 3 oxygen. Okay. So, where do you start? Well, the honest answer is it doesn't matter. As long as you keep track of everything you change from this point out, you can start anywhere you want. There's a couple things that I'll tell you just as sort of rule of thumb or helpful uh, things to keep in mind. 
Whenever you have an element like this, like oxygen, that's alone anywhere in the equation, leave it. You might have to change it later, but if you leave that until last, you can do whatever you need to to that oxygen molecule without affecting anything else. So elements by themselves, leave those for last. Other than that, you kind of just got to pick something and go with it. I'll start with carbon since it's first. On the left-hand side, there's three carbons. On the right-hand side, there's one carbon. You're always looking for numbers that both sides can go into. And in this case, one can go into three. And in order to get one to be three, what do I have to do? I have to multiply by three. So if I put a three in front of the CO2, that multiplies the CO2 molecule by three, which means I've got now three carbon atoms on the right-hand side, which matches the three carbon atoms on the left-hand side. The trick is that that three also multiplies times the oxygen because it's part of the same molecule. The coefficient multiplies everything until you get to a plus sign. All right, so everything in that, that molecule gets multiplied. Once you get the plus sign, you stop, and then you're in a different area. But so because I multiplied the three times this two for CO2, that's six, and then I still do have the other O over here, so a total of seven. Again, you've got to, every time you change something, go back and count everything up again and make sure you've got the right numbers. All right, so I fixed the carbon. The oxygen changed, but I'm going to, again, I'm going to save that for last because I've got oxygen by itself on one side. So the next thing to change is the hydrogen. Eight hydrogen on the left, two hydrogen on the right. What number do they both go into? Eight. And to get the two to be an eight, I multiply by four. Four water molecules gives me eight hydrogens. Change that from two to eight, because I multiplied water times four. But... As we saw with the CO2, multiplying water times 4 affects the oxygen also, not just the hydrogen. So i got to go back and count it up again. I have the 3 times 2 that I did the first time. That's 6. Now I've got 4 times 1. So altogether, I have 10 oxygens on the right-hand side. Hmm? We multiply by 4. So it's 4 times the 1, which isn't really there, but it's 1 oxygen. So 4 times 1 is 4. So now I've got carbon is all balanced, hydrogen is all balanced, oxygen is 2 on this side and 10 on that side, which means I'm going to have to come back over to the left-hand side. And if I multiply O2 by 5, then now I have 10 oxygen. Okay, so now the whole equation is balanced. Same number of carbons, same number of hydrogens, same number of oxygens on both sides by adding the coefficients. I didn't put anything over here, um, which means that there is a 1. Okay, there's no such thing as a 0 coefficient. There's also no such thing as a 1 and a half or any fraction of a coefficient. It's always going to be a whole number. I will also say... In general, the coefficients are smaller numbers, like single digits. That doesn't mean that there aren't cases where you're going to have big numbers. Um, you can, but if you start getting into coefficients bigger than 10, just be very careful and go back and double check um, because it's uncommon to have big numbers. Usually you can work it out with numbers less than 10. Okay, so then the last step which we kind of just did, is always just double check. Go back and count everything up again with all the changes you've made. So I didn't really change this first, um, whoops. Didn't change this first thing at all. So there's still three carbon and eight hydrogen on this side. I've multiplied O2 by five. So there's 10 oxygen. And then on this side, 
the 3 times 1 carbon gives me 3 carbon. 3 times 2 is 6 oxygen plus 4 times 1 means 10 oxygen. And then 4 times 2 hydrogen equals 8. Okay, so just double check, sort of write out a clean version like this, count up all the atoms again and make sure everything works out. And then you're done. So, again, the most important thing is every time you change something, count it all up again and, and write the new numbers down because once you lose track of something, it's going to be really hard to, to get it right. Always look to see if an element is in more than one place like this because you have to account for all of it. Um, the subscripts only apply to the element right in front of them unless... And this is on the worksheet that you're going to see in a second. If you have something like um, magnesium hydroxide, like that, where it's Mg and then something in parentheses like OH and then a 2 outside the parentheses, this 2 multiplies everything inside the parentheses by 2. And if there was a number like, um, let's say this was O3H, just for example, it would be... 2 times 3, or 6 oxygens in that case. That's the only time uh, the subscripts do more than one thing. The big numbers in front multiply everything in that molecule, all the little numbers in that molecule. All right, so we'll do some practice on this.